And you even wrote the like the the like quintessential guide for Google, right? Yeah. The, so uh, PWAs. If you right. go to web.dev, that is the Google uh, yeah. Chrome website, uh, they have different guides on different things. The PWA guide, uh, I, I'm the author of that one. So, um, the thing is that, but Google this year, I mean, they you can you can just go and check the companies. I'm talking about Google and Microsoft mainly, and maybe Samsung. Um, they this year they don't have they have any talk, any session, any article that mentions PWA. Hmm. But they're still talking about the technical stuff. Hmm. But they are saying web apps, okay, not PWAs anymore. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the 18th episode of the Front of Masters podcast. Today, we have Maximiliano Furtman on the podcast. He is a web and mobile developer for over 20 years, uh, very prolific with writing and teaching. And he's built this entire career from Buenos Aires. So we talk about that. We talk about the evolution of the web to mobile to PWAs and beyond. So I hope you enjoy the conversation. Well, Max, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I've got a bunch of questions. It's an interview style podcast. So we'll go through your career and, and what you're up to today and all that. So uh, first question is, you had mentioned in passing that you were interviewed by the president of Argentina. Can you tell me how that But came actually, up? we were in the same TV show. Okay. okay. And we were like around two hours. Actually, it was uh, something completely random. We were just there talking about when Facebook went down. So mm -hmm. I was just a tech guy there um, just talking about that and explaining what's going on. It was a DNS issue or something like that. So I was explaining the DNS on local like a broadcast TV show. And, and yeah, the current president was there and we were just uh, making jokes and things like that. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And uh, you've spoken at a lot of different conferences and, you know, flown around the world. Like, what are some of your favorite uh, conferences and, like, destinations? Uh, well, uh, destination is typically probably Europe. So I've been to 74 countries so wow. far. Um, and mostly for, for work, right? For conferences. Yeah, there may be five or six that were just for vacations, but most of them were actually for, for work. Uh, I think that I typically like Europe uh, in general. I mean, London and, and Spain in particular, that I, I typically like enjoy that, that a lot. In terms of conferences, um, it's difficult because uh, we have like uh, before the pandemic and after the pandemic. And That's true. There are a lot of How conferences. one before and one after? Well, one before, <laughs> uh, probably I, I used to like Fluent. Lot. Yeah, um, yeah, that was honestly one of my favorite conferences as well. And I think that's the first time I met you. I don't think you yeah, remembered it. Yeah. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I used to speak at the Fluent conferences and you were a speaker there. Yeah, yeah, I spoke so. at, I think at all of them uh, from Riley. I was, I was doing Velocity before Fluent actually existed. Velocity yeah. was the web performance mm -hmm. uh, conference from O'Reilly. I did OSCON, I think I was, but then Fluent appeared. And then, yeah. Everything's uh, everything uh, disappear. And yeah, I think that was my last conference I spoke at. It was 2014 Fluent. Okay, <laughs> so yeah. there you go. A decade like, ago. Yeah, yeah, a decade ago. Um, and then, how about a, a more recent conference? A more recent conference, I think I liked a lot the Dev Fest that happened in the Fest is typically a community organized uh, event from GDGs, Google Developer Groups. Mm. Uh, there was one at, at Nantes in France. Okay. That was actually pretty cool. It was a huge event wow. with uh, an organization that was actually pretty similar to the one from O'Reilly, like huge conferences. Mm. And I think it's it was DevFest, uh, Deb Nantes, oh. um, in France. I think okay. that was, the, if I need to pick one from after the pandemic, uh, yeah. that was pretty cool. Yeah, cool. Um, and then uh, any special skills that you have that people might not know about? Mm. Special skills. Um, I'm not sure if it's a skill, but yeah, I, 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 it's also really geeky. It's not really like a skill, but yeah, um, I'm a numismatic. So something completely out of the, so I collect coins and bag notes and something like that. It's not a skill, right? So yeah. uh, in terms of the skills, I don't know. Um, so what's yeah. your like most rare banknote or coin that you have? Uh, the most well, actually, within within numismatics, uh, I'm 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 collecting rare um, numbers, rare face values. So, mm. for example, I have a coin of three uh, U.S. cents, three cents. 
not mm. one, not five, three. Yeah, I don't think I've ever so, seen yeah, one of those. So yeah, so I collect those rare numbers huh. uh, uh, on top of that. And from US, I have the three cents, but then yeah, I have uh, like uh, from other countries, you have a weird number like seven dollars or things like that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's not a skill anyway. Yeah, but, yeah. but it's uh, it's a hobby. Yeah, it's, it's cool. Um, and then, what are some of your earliest memories of coding? Well, I, I, I I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if it's uh, something good or bad, but I have a lot, like, good memory. So it's, uh, I, I have the, the exact moment. <laughs> I, I remember the exact moment where I started coding. It was uh, when I was twelve, mm -hmm. and it was Pascal. Okay. Actually, so I started uh, my Hello World was in Pascal in a PC XT, I think, on eighty eight. Uh, that's early nineteen ninety two around that. So I have an uncle that he was actually uh, learning programming at university. So he was uh, learning that and I think he's playing that. Of course, I, I, I already was actually like someone liking computers. Mm. But um, I think the first time I, I, I had one line of source code was actually in Pascal, Turbo Pascal. Okay. Were you like making a game or something? Like uh, that? I did a, a couple of games. I also created. I mean, my biggest achievement at that moment was creating a clone of Norton Commander. I'm not sure if anyone even knows what Norton Commander was, but it was kind of um, the, the Mac OS Finder or the Windows Explorer, just mm. to explore your hard drive. And uh, it was actually a, a, an exact clone, even with I, I had additional features. I yeah. was the only one using it, actually. I had sure. the source code, and I mean, a few years ago, I I, I created an emulator and I could you run it again. It running. Yeah, nice. yeah, it's running. <laughs> I wish I would have saved some of those old. Files yeah, I have all the backups. Yeah. I actually, I, I have those backups in 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 diskettes. Mm. Talking about the big diskettes, the five inches, five. Yeah something inches, uh, then I moved those escape at some point to CD-ROMs and then to DVD-ROMs, and yeah, I so still have kept them. it all. And now they are in the cloud. That's awesome. Um, and then how, did, how about like, I know you love the web and programming for the web, like what was kind of your earlier well, my um, so I coding. was connect. I was uh, a user of BBS bulletin board systems. Mm -hmm. So the pre-internet era. So I'm from Argentina. I live in Buenos Aires. So uh, the internet actually appeared in 1995 there, mm -hmm. and the, I was uh, paying a, a one of these BBS services, and they they were they were one of the first one adding support for the internet. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that I had was an email address. That was pretty cool. Like sending an email uh, to, um, I think it was a list manager. So you, I was subscribing to a list or something like that and receiving the response around five seconds from US. So I was in Argentina receiving a response from US. was kind That's of wow. Yeah, yeah, mind blowing. Mind blowing. Yeah. And after that, they added uh, a browser that it actually it was links, a text based browser. Mm. Uh, and I remember the first uh, website that they browsed was Yahoo, yahoo.com, because I had uh, a book. Talking about the internet, and it was like the, the like the first website that they were uh, talking about was uh, Yahoo, and probably five months um, after that, uh, I, I had uh, someone near my my house that he was uh, doing uh, near the university, so my house was close to the university, and he was actually making uh, photocopies, like uh, they were printing the photocopies, uh, and someone went with an HTML book there and because the guy managing the business knew that i liked the uh, programming and things like that he made a copy a, a pirate copy of the book for me <laughs> and that was my first uh, introduction to html that's why 1996. Wow. so then i started doing some some web apps publishing those web apps in geocities uh, that was the way to publish website at the time yeah and yeah, I started doing well. Did you do any like uh, those animated gifts? Well, yeah, uh, it was, was, I, I, had, I still have some <laughs> uh, some CD ROMs that yeah. were sometimes uh, they came with some printed magazines, uh -huh. like uh, uh, gift collections or things like that, where you have the under construction yes, thing where that was you, very you had the gift. Yeah, exactly yes. like that. Yeah, I'm coming from that era. Yeah, yeah very cool. And then uh, where did you end up going to school or? You know, uh, did you study programming? Like so yeah, or? yeah, I studied programming. So um, I have some um, some kind of a bachelor in in, in in computer systems. So it's difficult to translate it from Ar the Argentinian system to the American system. But um, but actually, I didn't learn 
from there so i already knew the stuff i, sure. I was self um, yeah it was kind of self learner so i sometimes i knew more than the than my teachers at the yeah. time so it was my case that was my experience too it was actually a computer systems degree uh, yeah similar. something like that sometimes i would even like guest lecture at my own <laughs> college because it was like yeah uh Mark, you know this stuff better than anybody else. Yeah, Why don't exactly. You just yeah, teach some the class? teachers were when they were realizing they were saying, "Okay, like don't come to the class. You don't need to come. Just come yeah. to the, to the final test, and and, and you are good to go." And then, how about um, kind of? I, I think you've been mostly like freelancing and consulting, like your entire Not career, mostly, right? Mostly, one hundred percent, one hundred percent, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. I only had a few contracts, but they were. Anyway, uh, like for three or four months, but freelance anyway, like for big companies like sure. Google or Huawei. But it was has also under freelance contract. So mm -hmm. um, that's all. So I've never been an employee. And I think, I hope that will be the case for the rest of my life. I don't know. But I, yeah. I think it's probably a good chance that it will be <laughs> yeah. at this point. Um, what do you think is like one of the more pivotal projects that you did, say, earlier in your career? Um, so the, I think that starting with mobile very earlier, I think that that helped me a lot to get into the mobile space. So mm -hmm. I started doing um, mobile apps in 2001. Okay, so we are talking about devices that were just uh, text. Uh, maybe one year after that, we started talking about something known as WBMP. Mm -hmm. It was wireless bitmaps that were actually uh, like a bitmap, like a PNG, but just black and white and blah, blah. things so like that. you make like apps for those old Nokia I was, for, bricks? In that case, <laughs> it were not apps yet in okay. 2001. It was yeah. actually WAP portals. WAP portals. WAP, huh? So it was WAP uh, portals for, oh, WAP. for, it was WAP. It was hmm. wireless access protocol. I okay, think that, yeah. that's the name. We were using uh, WML hmm. for that. WML was kind of a XML-based uh, HTML, uh, something like that. And th two or three years after that, I started working with Java, j 2 me Java Micro Edition. In this case, we're talking about apps. I created a game. Uh, it was a car-based game uh, that is popular in, in South America. It's called Truco. Mm. It's, it's a car game. Uh, it's popular in Argentina, Brazil, and Uruguay. Um, I think that that uh, led to my first published book on, on, on mobile app development. Um, and that got me started with in, in the mobile space. That's cool. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, I mean, being able to make a successful, like, freelancer consulting career from Buenos Aires, like, what advice would you give to, you know, somebody who might be looking to take that path, mm -hmm. right? especially like being outside the US? Yeah, you know, there's different. Yeah, let's concerns. say that the first probably the first 10 to 15 years of my career was was actually local, right? So I was uh, all my the apps that I was doing or the consulting I was doing was actually for Argentinian companies. Okay, okay. so uh, then I got into the international market, but um, initially that wasn't the case. But I think that that was different because we are living in a different era now. So mm -hmm. now I know a lot of developers from Argentina from other countries that uh, their first job as a junior is actually working for a European company or mm -hmm. an American company uh, remotely. So mm -hmm. of course that wasn't the case when I when I started. Sure. Okay, so I'm not sure that my case can help uh, juniors these days. Because it's a, we are living in a different in a different world now, but um, I think that the first uh, my, my first uh, advice is to not uh, underestimate yourself. Sometimes you feel like, oh, I'm here in I'm in Buenos Aires, or it can be in India or whatever in Pakistan. Who is going to hire me? I don't know enough. And sometimes uh, when we when we live in those countries that are outside of the mainstream place, we think that. Me, people or developers or professionals in, in, in those mainstream areas, they know more than mm. us, but that's not the case. Maybe some will know more, some will know less, so it's not the case. Mm. So I think that it doesn't matter where you live, uh, what it matters is what you know and, and your expertise, your know-how, your uh, how smart you are to solve problems and and, yeah, and, and also to, to be, be a, like a good person. Yeah. yeah. Um, sounds like you've worked hard and and what what uh, like those early clients like did you go to like local businesses or like how did you land those kind of like early well clients? I think so I had I, I had luck I think so I've never had to sell myself 
Mm. So um, my f- actually, uh, my first website in GeoCities was for a friend that he was actually a pilot, an uh, uh, airplane pilot, and he was working with uh, some kind of an air club. So I created the website for them. Mm. My second project was for my um, high school. Mm. I created the high school website. That website got a prize, like the, the, one of the best websites in Argentina that year, in 1997. Uh, and that led me into some uh, a company hiring me for creating their website, and then another one, another one. And, and yeah. yeah, so your like, yeah. reputation yeah. kind of preceded yeah, exactly. yourself. But those earlier projects allowed it. Could yeah, exactly. Like those early projects that were out. basically projects that I didn't get money from it. So there were like the, sure. the, the trigger, okay, yeah. the, the initial fire mm-hmm. that uh, makes the whole chain that, that now I'm here. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. awesome. And then, uh, yeah, so you were a mobile developer, early kind of apps, even bef- before like iOS and Android yeah, that's and actually all that kind of stuff. Uh, seven years before iOS appeared. Yeah, and then you started writing books. Um, eventually, you really kind of like focused on PWAs. Like, how did mm-hmm. that come about, or what's kind of the early well, um, story there? Because I was a web developer before being a mobile developer, uh, I, I, I love the web. So, uh, and of course, at that time, native platforms like Java, uh, MicroEdition, Symbian development, uh, BlackBerry development was actually terrible, okay, um, compared with today's native platforms. So, but the web, uh, I was, um, so I, I, I was more confident with the web. So I was always um, like a web, I was always trying to make web apps for mobile. So as soon as those platforms appear, uh, I was doing web apps for kind of native apps uh, before, like five years before the PWA term even appeared. Mm. So uh, I created a web app for Symbian. They had a platform to doing that based on WebKit. It was called WRT, Web mm. Runtime, something like that. Um, then BlackBerry also had a web app platform, and we, you are creating we are using HTML, JavaScript, CSS, and packaging that somehow and publishing that in the, in their stores or as mm. a native app. So I was doing PWAs even before the PWA term appeared. When the iPhone appeared, when the first iPhone appeared, I'm not sure if you remember Steve Shops, the, the he was presenting the developer platform, and it was just web apps. Mm-hmm. at that time known as home screen web apps. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I got into that as well. Uh, that led probably to my first O'Reilly book. That was my first book published in English. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, it's that one that we've seen there. Um, and I have a full chapter on creating web apps for, uh, for iPhone uh, and so on. And yeah, and after that, actually six years after this book, the PW term appeared. So mm-hmm. when, when the concept appeared, I was already doing that stuff. So it wasn't something new for me. So I think that that, that led to my uh, expertise or, or my um, push into the PWA technology. Got it. And yeah, I think there was like phone gap and that kind of thing. So you could take, you know, the assets and package it on multiple app stores. That was for a while there. Is that even a thing anymore? Uh, well, actually, it is something that is still there, but just for legacy code. So sure. I, don't, I don't think anyone is starting a project these days in PhoneGap. Maybe it can be Ionic, that kind of uh, uh, an evolution of PhoneGap. Um, if you say so, Capacitor and things yeah. that they have, Ionic has there. But um, I still sometimes I still get re- requests for some PhoneGap uh, uh, consulting mm-hmm. or even training, but typically for legacy, uh, apps. legacy, yeah. co- legacy apps that were created um, 10 years ago or things sure. like that. So PhoneGap was a thing between 2008 and maybe 2015, 2016, uh, around that. So Adobe uh, actually acquired Natobi. Natobi, that was the company that created PhoneGap. So it was an Adobe a product. Then Adobe one day said, well, we are getting out of here. And they they uh, published that uh, to the Apache Foundation. Actually, they did that before, but and now it's Apache Cordova. So actually, Apache Cordova still exists. Mm-hmm. So you can still use it, but it's kind of a dead project. So. So what's the, like, you've seen kind of the going from mobile web apps uh, to PWAs, like, where are we at now? Like, what, what is So I think that we are in the moment where uh, we need to separate between the technical stuff and the marketing commercial terms. I think from a commercial point of view, we are in the moment where companies that were pushing PWAs uh, already accepted 
that it didn't work. Hmm. I mean, pushing the PWA term didn't work. And I mean, this year in and you even wrote the like the the like quintessential guide for Google, right? Yeah. The, so on uh, PWAs. If right. you go to web.dev, that is the Google uh, yeah. Chrome website, uh, they have different guides and different things. The PWA guide, uh, I, I'm the author of that one. So, um, the thing is that, but Google this year, I mean, they you can you can just go and check the companies. I'm talking about Google and Microsoft mainly, and maybe Samsung. Um, they this year they don't have, they have any talk, any session, any article that mentions PWA. Hmm. But they're still talking about the technical stuff. Hmm. But they're saying web apps, okay, not PWAs anymore. Um, I try to ping the team to try to get a quote about that and yeah they kind of saying well yeah we're trying to use the web app term because it's more uh, general and sometimes they say installed web apps um i could see that we're not we're not against the pwa term yeah. anymore also also i was the host of the pwa summit or one of the hosts of the uh, PWA Summit was uh, an event organized by Google, Microsoft, uh, Intel I think and other company that it was held for two years in a row. So uh, the last one, I was the one doing the, the interviews and the post talk uh, chat and the, um, the panel, I was the host of the panel. Um, but yeah, after that, it's like no one is talking about PWAs anymore. Mm. Again, not because they don't want the concept, but I think they're, they are um, changing the name, the term, and let's, web app seems better. Okay, yeah. let's, let's stay with web apps. Um, so it's not a, a technical problem. Uh, I think it's more about the, the business side. Uh, it seems like we try to push that. And I think one important part here is Apple. Mm. Apple never used the term PWA, only mm. from a legal point of view. They mm. use it to defend themselves, saying that um, the lawyers brought, uh, when they, they were having legal problems with the App Store and uh, that they are, uh, they are monopoly and things like that. And one of the answers was like, no, no, we have an alternative. It's called PWA. Uh, that's the only moment where Apple actually talk about PWAs. But now Safari is supporting PWAs yeah, in iOS, iPad, like, and macOS. What do they call it then? Web apps. Web apps. So, it's so like I think that that's why installed the installed web apps, installed web apps, so or, desktop web apps. Yeah. That's so such that's why a weird I think term. Chrome and and Microsoft they're saying okay we will have to maybe it's, it's a good moment to uh, match Apple so. All of us are just using web apps and mm. we understand what we are talking about. Um, also, Chrome has changed the requirements for, for uh, installing a PWA. Now you don't need a service worker. So mm. initially, for the first five years, you, your app should have a service worker. That The idea is that it should offer an offline experience. Mm. If not, it's not going to be installable on desktop or it's not going to be it's not going to get the best installation on Android. And that's uh, that has changed last year. Mm. Now the only thing you need is an icon, the metadata, and if you don't offer an offline experience with a service worker, you will have an offline um, an, off an offline screen, a customized screen with your icon saying that, oh, oops, there is no connection, uh, try it later. So now it's not mandatory anymore mm. because on Apple, it wasn't mandatory as well. So there now Chrome, I think it's like uh, making one step back mm. and saying, okay, uh, maybe it was too much. We, we couldn't push the whole idea enough. And it's, they're making one step back and said, okay, I think we're talking about web apps, but this is my opinion, right? It's not the, sure. their official word, but this is what I see. And I think uh, we are going back to the idea of talking about web apps and it's just a web app that you can install. Um, you can get, uh, but I mean, we will still use the PWA term for a while, technically at least. But from a business point of view, I don't think anyone will try to uh, to go to a company and say, oh, you have to make a PWA. I think we yeah. will just talk about web apps. Yeah, we were talking about our desktop experience for front of masters and it was like, what is going to be our approach here? And we we're looking at uh, YouTube has like a really nice PWA or sorry, installable web app. Installable web app, yeah. <laughs> whatever. I use but, the YouTube music one. Yeah, mm -hmm. and you can just pop it out. You can download files offline, all mm -hmm. these kinds of things. Um, but they seem to be the only one that really has that kind of like experience nailed down. And when I asked everybody else, do you use this? Everybody else on the team, I was the only one that used it. So it's, uh, it, it seems like the capability is there, but people don't know. No, I that think they that, can but, do but these that, that problem that you are um, 
you are mentioning, it was the problem of PWAs from the from the first mm -hmm. moment that uh, some of us from the technical side we see the power, but for whatever reason, it's difficult to penetrate. There is yeah. like a like a wall, like a hidden wall somewhere, and it's difficult to penetrate um, other developers. Uh, sometimes it's, it's still today when I when I when I demo a PWA that you can install a PWA and get a full experience on iOS, on Android, on desktop, Mac OS, Windows, Linux, and they saw it. Says, "Oh, I didn't know that." And they are senior web developers, and they yeah. still don't know about that. Yeah. So I, I'm not completely sure why. Okay, what's the problem? And also from a business side, it was always a problem. Okay, to sell this. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, there was uh, last year, maybe 2023, with uh, Apple with legal issues, and now in Europe uh, that they have problem with the App Store. They need to open the App Store. There are a lot of companies saying, okay, maybe we should start working with web apps. Um, and they're, they're, yeah. I know because of some companies that are uh, um, asking for consulting or something, I've, I've seen an increase after uh, the, like it, it may be the end of the App Store um, monopoly. Um, I've seen a race of, let's go back and see if we can do this with the web. Mm. Yeah, I know like uh, Basecamp and those folks have been advocating for it. And I think it was like Flipkart in India or something. Has well, that was one of, of the first PWAs that were uh, 2016, maybe, that Flipkart was actually one of the uh, biggest PWAs out there. It was typically part of every, when you were uh, showing use cases and uh, the best business uh, cases for PWA, Flipkart was always there. Yeah. yeah. But I'm not sure now, because I, I remember one here in the... Um, in, in the States, uh, it was 100 flowers. Mm. It was the first um, PWA that replaced their uh, Google Play Store app mm. with a PWA. Wow. So the, the Play Store app, they, they, uh, they used uh, Trusted Web Activities, TWA. That is a way that we have to publish PWAs in the Google Play Store. Mm. They were the first one to completely replace their native app, their Java native Android app, mm -hmm. that was five years ago before Kotlin, that's why I'm saying Java, um, with the PWA, okay? It was highlighted everywhere. It was actually pretty cool. It was faster mm. than their, their previous native app, but it, I think it lasted two years, and now they are back They're to a native one. Um, sometimes it's because so. no one actually got the advantage enough or it's it's the business of selling native apps we have that yeah. business as well yeah we, we'll see what the future of it is mm -hmm. right yeah um and then uh with with like front of masters you've been teaching for a while now and i mean you've really taught a ton of courses a lot of places and that kind of thing but uh your most popular one with us is on vanilla javascript can you kind of Maybe explain maybe a project that you've done in vanilla JavaScript that you're proud of, or you know just kind of why your you know well, fascination. Yeah, with, uh, with for me it was a surprise. I mean, actually, too that that that's the most popular one. Uh, mm -hmm. I wasn't expecting that, but um, it's part of what we were talking before about my history doing web apps. So all those web apps that I've been doing since 2002 and three for mobile devices um, were actually vanilla JavaScript apps. Um, so um, I remember there is a one big application that I've created for the like the, um, the New York Times of Argentina. Let's say the most uh, popular um, newspaper in Argentina is called Clarín. So and they they have a, a game. It was a soccer game. Actually, uh, you bid on, on your soccer team. You were creating your own team. Mm -hmm. um, it was a really complex application. Uh, I did that application for Java for them, so it was a consulting for, for them, for Java, for BlackBerry, for many platforms. And then I had to do a web app for some mobile devices and for smart TVs. Mm. So smart TVs at the time, they, they were also uh, supporting web apps as a platform. And I had to, there were, we're uh, talking about the, the era of jQuery, mm. but I couldn't use jQuery for performance reasons. Mm. Because of course the CPU of those devices were not Good enough. I mean, it, it they they could run jQuery, but the performance was really uh, degrading. So, 
I started like uh, creating my own microlibrary and understanding vanilla JavaScript. It, we were not using the term vanilla JavaScript at the yeah, time. It was just JavaScript. <laughs> it was just JavaScript. Yeah. And yeah, so I started applying design patterns so just because it was a really huge application with uh, 4 million users mm. uh, using the game at the same time. Um, and yeah, that led to me to uh, love the JavaScript and understanding the browser. And we didn't have at the time all the APIs that we have these days yeah. for m modularization, for, for performance, uh, uh, routing, everything was really hacky at the time. Um, and now we have a lot of APIs that can let you create a lot of apps. And actually, you don't need all the build process um, that you have today. Just think about a Hello World in React and think about all the steps that mm. happens until you actually get something on the screen. Uh, it's a huge, complex uh, scenario. I'm not saying it doesn't work at some point, yeah. at some apps. I'm not, I'm not advocating for reinventing the wheel. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that times you don't need a wheel. And, yeah. and you're using a wheel because it's, it's the only tool that you know. Yeah. Um, I think there's a world where you know, performance critical or performance centric applications for instance like VS code decided to create their own you know rendering pipeline with vanilla javascript mm -hmm. or uh, recently um, Microsoft's browser edge they you know I, they ditched react and they you know are working in um, I, be I believe they're working with web components but again web components is just kind of a, a light layer on top of the Dom but I think for in like I also made um, like currency comparing widgets and different like real time data widgets uh, for Dow Jones and like at the time I just needed you know something that's you know it's performance sensitive and I needed to work everywhere and mm -hmm. um, so I think that from that perspective it makes a lot of sense but I realized that that that's maybe only like five percent of apps or whatever but. Those are the kinds of things that I think you can get paid really, really well for. If you like really understand the APIs and you can go direct to them, of course it's going to be faster. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. and, and now it's um, it's also a, a really advantage for developers. Even if you are mainly working on React and Vue and yeah. Svelte, it's a really advantage if you know vanilla JavaScript because when you have a problem, when you need to get out for a sec mm -hmm. to the browser, uh, now companies are really um, appreciating when you know but yeah. JavaScript. But yeah, obviously, learn the tool for the job. If you, yeah, if you want to be the best React React developer, go for it. But yeah. it, it is it is uh, cool that that those vanilla JavaScript courses are doing so well. And then, how did you end up getting into you know kind of speaking and teaching? In well, I, I I think that before speaking um, on on conferences, I was speaking on TV back in Argentina, right? Mm -hmm. um, and not being interviewed, I was the one doing the interviews. Okay. So I was a technical guy in a TV show that was around the internet. So I was doing the interviews to uh, dot com companies, uh, things like that. So I was explaining things. So I started doing that kind of uh, speaking on TV, on a camera. Uh, but then um, I moved into teaching as well at, at that time. I even had uh, something like this that we have right now mm -hmm. in 2003. Mm. We didn't. We, we were not using the term podcast. Yeah, sure. Actually, YouTube didn't exist at the time. Mm. We didn't have HTML video, so uh, I did a. We we call it actually a TV show on the web. Mm. Okay? It was called Webmasters TV. Okay. Uh, I think it lasted fifteen um, episodes. Okay. And I was doing interviews. We were talking about the news on the web for webmasters. That was the term for a web developer at the time. Um, and we were uh, shipping that in Windows Media video with an Act ActiveX plugin. So you can actually see because there were no, no video at the time, no YouTube, no actually platforms to, to, to ship videos. So I, it started there. At the time, then I started doing like like moving from TV to conferences, it was kind of the same thing. Um, and internationally, um, outside of Argentina, I think that my first um, talk was on mobile widgets. That is a term that we don't use these days. Mobile widgets. I, I my slides are still on a slide share, mm. so it's, it's every once in a while I tweeted the, those slides. Widgets were actually PWAs, 
mobile widget. It was 2009, and it was an O'Reilly conference known ins as Inside Mobile. That I think it was it ran only one year that year. Mm. It was called Inside Mobile. It was held in the PayPal headquarters in San Jose, in California. And so I traveled there. It was my first uh, uh, talk, my first session in English for an international conference. And after that, um, that book appeared, uh, okay. actually. Um, and yeah, another conference invited me. Yeah, and then, yeah, it sounds like similar with your consulting journey where you landed a few and then it sort of snowballed from there it seems like yeah. same thing with your conferences yeah and, same same thing with, with and then eventually teaching and that kind of thing it's like you do one thing you do it well and then other folks yeah. recognize that yeah. and then bite Something you out like that. yeah yeah that's cool yeah i think uh cal simpson originally recommended you yeah exactly that's how I, I go to you yeah. yeah yeah very cool and then uh do you have any tips for folks who are interested in getting started with speaking and teaching um yeah, just try, and I think that the typically the typical advice here is uh, to uh, start with a user group, with a local user group that mm -hmm. they are typically eager for for new talks and sessions. And sometimes you feel like uh, I don't have anything to say or something like that. And that's typically not true. Just talk about your experience. If you have a project, of course, if you have permission to talk about the project in your company, um, just um, making a story of that, uh, the problems, the challenges you faced, and explaining that uh, it's, it's actually pretty pretty. Cool. Um, the first time it's always difficult, but um, yeah, you have if you have a partner that can help you in checking your slides uh, and in listening for uh, listening to you speaking for the first time, uh, that helps a lot. Mm. Um, most of the time, um, try it, um, and it, nothing really, really bad will happen. I mean, we think that the first time we see, oh, what, what happens if it? I mean, typically the audience will be on your side, and don't be don't yeah. be so hard with you and, and try yeah, it. The and, audience is looking for you to succeed. Yeah, not exactly. Looking for your mistakes. But you whatever. feel the other way. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, know. you feel like yeah. everyone is is trying to find uh, a yeah. typo or something to make fun of you. So that's yeah. your feeling. Yeah. But yeah, that's not true. Yeah, I definitely have had that feeling when I was speaking in the early days. It's like, oh no, they're gonna find out Sorry. these mistakes. My career or whatever. Is, yeah. is is done. Getting, yeah. yeah, exactly. But at the end of the day, they just want to see a good show and. If you show them some new cool things, they're going to be excited about it, for sure. Uh, do you have anything on your horizon, uh, either personally or professionally, that you're really excited about? Um, no, nothing in particular, but um, I think that we are in this era that we don't know what will happen in five years in, mm. in, in this field, right? So yeah. In five years, not even in 10 years. So I think that... That for some people is fear. They feel fear. Uh, I feel excitement. So I know that um, I'm not sure if you're going to be doing the same thing in five years. I don't know. I'm not yeah. saying no. I'm saying I don't know. Yeah. So um, I'm not sure if I'm still going to be teaching, if someone will be interested in mm. listening to someone uh, teaching field or not. I don't know. Okay. So I think that that, uh, that opens opportunities. I still don't know where the path will go, but um, I, I feel excitement on that. Yeah, um, I think uh, there's this graphic that I've seen recently about um, on one end you have like success or too much success or whatever, but like it kind of leads to boredom or like no change, that kind of thing. And the other end is like fear mm -hmm. and anxiety and that kind of thing. And, and somewhere in the middle is your like flow state, which is, you know, you're yeah, you're succeeding, but also you're a little bit scared or mm -hmm. fearful. And it's like kind of leads into this sort of hyper productive yeah. state. And yeah, definitely have seen that with a lot of folks uh, recently where it's like people seem to be extremely focused, <laughs> doing lots of great work. So, and it, it, it is exciting. And we can get a lot done in that yeah. state for sure. Um, are there any like bucket list things or like, you know, Anything that you can think of, you're like, I just really want to do that. Could be personally. Uh, no, bad. so 74 countries. Uh, I yeah. still have a couple more, <laughs> maybe. Uh, finishing the list can be. I mean, I'm not yeah. looking for uh, like yeah. uh, like 
get put, to it, put it down on everything. Get to a hundred, maybe. Yeah, I get to a hundred, and, and that's all. So I have two kids. So seeing yeah. seeing them grow, grow yeah. and, and be happy. I mean that that it goes. I mean that part now goes to 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 my kids and my family. You know, yeah. More than to my professional life. Yeah, absolutely. And then, uh, are there any kind of themes that tie your career together? Uh, something that's just kind of in your head well in my you're... case that, yeah. that that's might not be the case for for a lot of developers but because i do this um i do consulting and teaching and speaking and i think that um i think it's uh it's like a loop so i cannot um teach if i don't do some consulting and apps as, at the same time and mm. so uh, speaking has to do with teaching as well uh, so i think it's uh, like i found that loop that make everything work but mm -hmm. if I take out one part, I don't think uh, it's going to last. So I don't see myself just teaching the same thing every day, every year that I'm not actually using in the real world or, or things like that. So um, also teaching uh, makes me uh, learn new stuff mm -hmm. and be more um, inside the framework or, or language. So my consulting is better as well. So yeah. I think that that, that loop uh, is, is the one that uh, made me succeed. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, that definitely separates a great teacher is having real world experience to back it up. So they're not just speaking from some book they read or whatever. It's like, no, I've applied this in the real world. Now I'm going to teach yeah. you the things that sure. that work for me. So yeah, I agree. That's, that's a great loop mm -hmm. uh, or circle or whatever you want to yeah. call it. But all right, well, thanks. Uh, Thanks for joining Thank the Thank you podcast. for having me. Yeah, yeah. It's a good place to wrap up. So uh, cheers. Okay. Thanks. Hey there. Before you go, don't forget we're new at this. So any feedback, whether it's a like or subscribe, we'll take those. Or a comment about what you didn't like or what you'd like to see more of in the future. We'll definitely incorporate that into the next episodes. Uh, I'm really enjoying these conversations. So any type of feedback would be fantastic. And especially sharing it with your friends and colleagues. So really appreciate it. Thanks for listening. See you in the next one.